Kia ora whanau and welcome to Around the Grounds, a podcast from New Zealand Rugby bringing you closer to our national game. Sometimes you have to go to the top, so at Around the Grounds we have done exactly that and we've pulled the big dog into the studio. Welcome to New Zealand's leading grassroots and community rugby podcast, Mark Robinson, CEO of New Zealand Rug- Rugby. How are you, Robbo? Uh, I'm doing really well. It's great to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. I'm looking forward to um, today. We have been certainly around the grounds and around different parts of the country and world in recent times, but... No, no, I'm really excited to, to be here and, and tuning in with the listeners. Mate, you all travel, there's no doubt about that, whether it be around the country or around the world. But, you know, do you, do you still block out a bit of time in the schedule for family? Like, what are the kids up to? Are they, I know mine are about to start college. Like, where are yours at? And you're making sure that you're still getting a bit of time with them and, and um, you might not be the glorified Uber service that I am currently. <laughs> Hopefully they've got their own wheels and, and a bit of independence, but... Um, how are they going? You're still able to check in with family um, as much as you possibly can? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've probably, as you say, I've, I've probably done my time <laughs> as, a, as a taxi service a little a little while ago. Um, so my eldest uh, hunter, is he's off in university on the Gold Coast at the moment. Oh, so wow. we had how a... Good. Yeah, yeah, I was a little bit envious, I must say. I was over on the weekend seeing him. <laughs> so we had a Super Rugby Commission week uh, meeting in Sydney on Friday, and then I was able to... Um, pop up Friday night and have a couple of nights in. My wife Nova flew over to, to join us. So we got to watch him play a bit of footy on, on Saturday oh, wow. afternoon. They played a local derby against um, Queensland University. Oh, wow. And we had a it was, it was a really great day. I mean, he's at, he's at Bond University. They had a great little facility there. And, uh, you know, people say a lot about Australian rugby. They had a great community day, yeah. really strong club competition in, in Brisbane. Uh, met up with some old... Um, some old buddies that um, I used to play with, and some old, you know, older personalities around the Australian games. Guys like Brett Robinson, who oh, I'm on awesome. World Rugby board with, and him and I used to play against yeah. each other in the Brumbies and the and the Wallabies. Um, Greg Cornelson, the oh, great Wallaby, who scored four tries, tries in the park. The yeah, Lats, absolutely. So, um, so Bond had a a 20 year reunion for a, a senior club team that won the championship. But the hospital hospital cup, I think it is, um, back all those time ago, where I think Greg was involved with Alec Evans, who's a, an amazing former um, Wallabies coach, was hugely yeah. successful, a former Wallaby. You know, some really great people um, to, to catch up. Scott Johnson, who coached all around yes. the world and and was a leading high performance um, professional um, in Australia up until very recently. So yeah, it was really good fun. You know, we had. You know, watch watch the kids play, and, and ironically, Hunter, uh, my son, and and Brett's son were playing against each other in the Colts <laughs> team. So, so we had a we had a great time sitting around, and and I guess we both reflected, having you know been involved in the game ourselves for a long time, that how good's footy when you oh, sit yeah. back and you you watch your two boys sort of twenty five years after the yeah. you know we'd, we'd played each other and have a beer with them in the in the club rooms afterwards, and um and meet all these other amazing people around the game. We we really are blessed, you know, with uh, the sport we're involved with. Just makes it all seem uh, that long ago, doesn't it, Robbo, when you put the boots on? But I think you hit something there like, yep, we talk a little bit about some of the challenges in rugby and Australian rugby, but like, geez, that's one part they get right, whether it be sort of the Shoot Shield Club competition in Sydney. I know the Queensland Club Club competition is really strong as well, and they do a good job around making a day of it, don't they? They sort of seem to be able to line all the teams up at one club and, and sort of things kick off at lunchtime and through the whole day and, you know, maybe a slightly better climate in, <laughs> in, in Queensland as well. But but yeah. the, the grassroots aspect there has some uh, fantastic elements to it, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, and um, you know, it's it's exciting and heartening to see, you know, it's in, in such positive shape. But, uh, you know, same thing, I guess if I touch on the um, rest of the family, I have more than, more than, more than just under, you know, so um, I've got a daughter, Maggie, who's last year at, at um, college here in Auckland, and Heck. I've got a uh, my youngest son, Will, who's um, fourth form at Auckland Grammar. So, and, and I must say, getting around and watching them play sport, you know, we, we have some tremendous things going on here too, you know, and, yeah. and I think we need to recognise that. Sometimes that's forgotten, and uh, Maggie plays a lot of netball at this time of the year, and she's in a great you know, competition at the moment, having lots of fun with that. And Will's playing at footy as well. And, um, you know, again, having a great time, and it's been awesome these last four or five weeks. Uh, their, their seasons have kicked off, and we've had so much joy getting around and seeing them develop, you know, the mateship and... And uh, having a lot of fun with it and testing themselves on a Saturday and enjoying the trainings and all the stuff that goes with the benefits of playing sport, which um, sometimes when there's a lot of noise you know, around the game is forgotten because at the heart of it all, that's where we all came through and enjoyed the game. And, and at its most purest sense, that's where um, 
you know, um, rugby is such a tremendous um, sport and an amazing vehicle for doing so many great things in our community. Absolutely. And, you know, it's not always something we talk about in rugby, but going off to, you know, college, high school, whatever we're calling it, is like, that's quite a big milestone in a young man's life and perhaps being in, in a team environment in a sport that they love with mm-hmm. people who have, you know, shared values and passions is a great way to kind of enter that new environment as well. So it's great to hear mm-hmm. um, that Will's doing that. Um, you know, well, obviously, um, surely Robbo, yeah, if you can remember many years ago, you know, um, you kicked off your rugby journey. It's very important on this podcast that we get your grassroot um, and community club rugby credentials. You know, where did it all kick off for you? Was it was it bare feet in the Taranaki somewhere? Like, tell us about your early days in the game. Yeah, I mean, they, I just sort of um, feel myself, <laughs> you know, really... Um, feeling happy, I guess, as you ask that question, Rob, you know, because my mind immediately cast back to, uh, for me, it was a little place called Kaponga, where I grew up in South Taranaki, right under um, uh, the mountain there, in Mount, Mount Taranaki, right just south of the mountain. And um, yes, we, my brother and I shipped off to the local rugby grounds in, in <laughs> Kaponga. Free, I mean, it was cold there. People tell stories about barefoot and, and frosty grounds. This was a real deal, you know, <laughs> as it relates to those sort of conditions. But we played an amazing you know, townships all around um, South and Central Taranaki, Stratford, Toko, Douglas, Hawada, Eltham, yeah. uh, out the coast where I went to high school eventually in Opanaki. Um, Aurora, you know, all, all of these amazing little towns all had teams and that, and and um, we would connect with on a Saturday. And on a on a bad day right in the middle of winter, you know, we were like heaps of other kids. We were sort of thrown into the boot of the car on the way home because uh, it would be, you know, terrible nowadays to think of that. But we were so muddy and covered and... Yeah. and uh, and dirt and all sorts of things. That, that that was the journey home. We didn't live far from home, to be fair. You know, we're only a couple of k's from <laughs> from uh, from the rugby ground. Sorry. And then we'd you know have have lunch, and then before we knew it, we were back into Carpong and watch the seniors play. And we had people like Ian Allison oh, wow. um, playing for Carpong, Kieran Crowley, all the Crowley brothers, for that matter. You know, at one stage, were playing senior rugby for Carpong, and they were a really successful team out of this very very tiny town. So. Um, that was where my junior club was, um, and then I went off to to high school, to Opanaki, as I say, and played, um, you know, right through my, my five years at high school there for the um, for the school, and had a great couple of years in uh, in the first fifteen in my in my last two years where we and really enjoyed ourselves and had a little bit of success too. So lots of fun. Mate, did you maybe sneak back to the Naki for a, a reunion? Was it recently? Like, was it? Um, were we, you know, telling you know stories badly, or you know, <laughs> is it still all those names that you mentioned? Then were they, um, you know, perhaps people you don't see as much as you'd like to, and were able to catch up and reflect on on some of those memories? Yeah, we had an amazing. Uh, you've done your homework, Rob. It's good to see. <laughs> um, we we had an amazing time. It must have been oh, three or four weekends ago now, and. Um, so it was a bit of an impromptu. I think a few of us bumped into each other over the sort of festive season, and so we've got to get back. You know, it'd been a, a few years since we'd done something, um, but team sort of played together in 1990, 91, 92. So it was sort of yeah. just over 30 years of of sort of um, having played back in the day, which <laughs> sounds pretty scary as you say it, doesn't it? And um, some of the guys could make it on the Friday night. I couldn't get in until until Saturday, but yeah, we met. You know, up at the school, and we watched the um, uh, one of the school teams play up where we used to play, and we you know walked around the school and had a great time, sort of reminiscing, and then um, down into the middle of town for lunch in Opanaki for uh, for a bit of a graze, and then we walked up to the up to the ground where the main event was when Coastal were playing Southern in a derby game. So, um, big crowd there, you know, fantastic sort of um, impromptu. Um, grandstand made with flat yep. deck trucks and, and big hay bales and again not maybe the best in observing some of the modern day HEC evils but there were just a fantastic uh, buzz around the ground you know afternoon footy a beautiful day and yeah we just had a great time catching up with lots of people who'd come from sort of around the district because of the derby and it was Opanaki's 150, uh, 125th wow. anniversary as well so a great day in the club rooms afterwards and they they um they raised a few funds with some, um, you know, with an auction and, and did some different stuff. So, yeah, we, we you know, um, hung around there at the club rooms for a while and then wandered back into Opanaki down to the pub and had a good time there. So so it was a really special time, you know, and we've sort of galvanised ourselves again. We've got to do this more often. <laughs> yeah, and totally. all the guys, you know, we played with were, um, 
you know, fantastic. They've gone on and done different things and have families of their own now. So a lot of sharing of what's going on in their own worlds now and then pretty quickly went back to those 30-odd years ago and told lots of lies and stories yeah. about the past. And, beautiful. you know, the older we get, the better we were sort of yeah. thing. So it's, it's good fun. It's a beautiful thing. There must be there must be a couple of memories that stick out from the grassroots from the club days. You know, like you mentioned some pretty famous names. I know the Barretts are from the area. Like surely Robbo got a spray as a young man from Smiley Barrett or, or surely I think even you might even – Don the boots with your brother for third grade a few times. Like that's grassroots stuff, isn't it? Like that, that's pretty cool. Did you any of those sort of things stick out in the memory, or, or maybe a story, an embellished story in there? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was lucky to play um, a lot of rugby. So after I finished university in Wellington, I, I played for a couple of years and at um, at Coastal um, before, in between going to Cambridge University and back. I yeah. sort of played a number of seasons, and yeah, Smiley was in in that. Um, team and I yeah I did I did remember copying a couple of sprays from if the standards weren't up and I didn't play well enough I remember coming home from uh the UK in must have been my second season and um straight into playing for Coastal and a game wasn't going so well and he he sort of let me know in un, no uncertain terms that I probably wasn't I was sort of had a scarfy with my head halfway around the world <laughs> back in England still and wasn't really pulling my weight so um so no, we yeah, there's, there's probably a few yarns there, um, but I was really lucky to play with a guy like him. He yeah. he epitomised everything around you know, and guys like Alan Crowley was playing, um, Gary Mello who played a few games for Taranaki, Andrew Fleming who played first class rugby. Awesome. And those were guys that were all playing into their thirties then, who'd played a lot of first class rugby and still giving back yeah. and playing a lot of club rugby. And so I was really lucky to have that as a was I twenty one, twenty two year old and um, learning a lot from them. Um, on and off field, you know, they were they were great guys to be around. So that was certainly a lot of fun while I was still playing quite seriously. And then as I finished and I came back to Taranaki after having, you know, finished playing in Japan, this was in the, you know, late 2000s, 2008, 9, 10 through there, and played a bit of third grade. And funnily enough, Smiley was still there. I couldn't get away from him. So, um, so uh, and my brother, yeah, he was there. It was special to play again because we hadn't played together since we left school and there was a couple of other guys that had played for Taranaki and at school as well. So I mean, three or four seasons there, you know, yeah. playing in a, in a really sort of scary high quality of yeah. rugby and physicality. And I was going to say, once the whistle blows, rugby's rugby, isn't it? Like, yeah. Even though, you know, maybe the, the body doesn't operate quite yet like you'd like it to, you still pride's an issue and you get out there and rip in, don't you? And I'm sure those guys would be super competitive. Yeah, they, they were. And it was, um, it, was, it was great because you could turn up, you know, one o'clock kickoff um, – and like you were saying before, you've got a young family, you sort of know what it's about. But have a young family, busy weeks, and then Saturday was just an opportunity to sort of chill out a bit, catch your yeah. breath, watch the kids play a little bit of sport. But then you could turn up at sort of 10 to 1. <laughs> um, you know, warm-up constituted getting into the into the yeah. changing room, sort of lacing your boots up and then yeah. running onto the field. So it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And if you did make training, it was a, a game of touch yeah. once a week. And, um, and that, was, that was a huge amount of fun. So... Yeah, and I would have been late thirties by then, and Brilliant. you know, and uh, yeah, I just think that we we had such a good time, and you could either, you know, wander home if you had something on with family, or you could watch the seniors play, and yep. a lot of young kids coming through, like the you know Smiley's boys and and other young people that um, we sort of knew indirectly by virtue of growing up in the area and seeing all those children come through was was good fun too. So, yeah, very fond memories. Pretty cool. And some of the names you mentioned earlier, you know, Kieran Crowley, I think Graham Murray's from the area. Like mm. that's, you know, we, you know, for yourself, uh, no one ever expects to probably, you know, play, well, professional rugby wasn't even a thing when you were very young, but go on and be an all black. But, you know, perhaps at least they showed that people from the area could do that. You know, perhaps you looked at those guys, like you say, when you're young, go down and watch um, some club footy and, and there's a couple of all blacks running around like that's. Um, that's pretty motivating or I, I would say for a young person from the area to see it's all possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, another great name there, and Graham, you know, Graham Murray was coaching uh, when I first returned from university to play for Coastal, play oh, senior good. rugby. So, so Goss had returned. He'd been out of rugby for a little while, come back to the region, and wanted to give back to the club. So he must have coached for you know four or five years and did yep. a great job. So, yeah, all of those um, people as they are now. You know, when I go back and at, at different times, if if the Barrett boys are back, you know, you see them and the way they connect with the community and. Yep. Um, you know, some things have changed around maybe the regularity those guys can get yeah. back. But when they are there, they are highly invested. They love the environments. They they truly remember where they came from. Yeah. And it's wonderful to see the sort of sparkle in the kids' eyes when, when those sort of people are around the environment. But but you're right, you know, through the formative years of anywhere from five to sort of 16 or 17, I had, I had lots of sort of interactions with those sort of people, which, um, 
yeah, I guess they, they do give you a sense of anything's possible when you're rubbing shoulders with them. Robbo, not one to blow your own trumpet, but you know, like rugby turned professional in 96 and, and you were able to play some professional footy, which was pretty cool. You know, like you had stints with the Crusaders, you know, you're in all black nine test matches. Like, um, firstly, um, you know, I want to ask ask a lot of the players that we have on podcasts around, you know, getting named in the All Blacks and what did that look like for you? You know, like, where did you hear it? Where's your jersey? You know, all, all those fantastic moments that it doesn't really matter um, when that happens for someone in their career, whether it's 50 years ago or, or five months ago. It's it's pretty awesome. Like, what was it like for you? Uh, well, it was, yeah, it was it was fantastic, and it's. Um you know, no matter how sort of, hopefully, how, how old I get, I'll, I'll have, you know, really fond memories of those times. Um, my recollection of being named in the All Blacks is we'd played um, the Brumbies um, for the Crusaders in the 2000 Super Rugby Final in Canberra, the the night where it, it Canberra literally froze. And, um, I don't think Canterbury touched the ball, I think, did they, in that game? Yeah, they won the game, yeah. but I don't think they touched yeah, it. Yeah, no, that's right. We made a lot of tackles. <laughs> um, a bit of Ruben, uh, sorry, um, Ron Cribb brilliance and... Yeah. Mertz kicked a few goals, um, but you know we we managed to hang in there and, and win, and um, obviously had a great celebration afterwards, and then came back uh, into Christchurch, and I think when we landed, um, my recollection they they sort of named the team, so we were sitting on a plane, and I was sitting alphabetical order, so I was sitting by Greg Somerville, who's yeah. um, a great mate, and and we played a lot of footy together, and we were both named at the same time, and I think Leon McDonald was sitting just up the plane a little bit, so it was quite a Quite a really um, interesting sort of, um, yeah, surreal yeah. sort of way to find out here. And, <laughs> Not and only then, formal. Yeah, yeah, just. And then I'd found out, that, you know, I'd, I'd sort of only just had a cell phone and all that. And, of course, these strange things like texts are starting yeah. to fly around and yep. your phone lights up. And then I remember getting off the plane and um, and talking to mum and dad. And, and by then they'd knew and sort of before I did and they were at home with some people having um, a bit of a catch-up and a celebration with, with families that we knew as we were growing up and that sort of thing. So, so that was a really special time, yeah. And then... Uh, it, it was a bit of a blur, really, that season. You know, you're into camp pretty quickly after you finish Super Rugby, and away we went. Test debut, do you remember it? Like, you sort of, did someone get a heads up during the week? Robbo, you're going to play in this game, get given your jersey, that sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, Smith, Wayne Smith was coaching, oh. and um, so I think I think it was the second test against Scotland in, in Auckland, and the first test might have been in, it was in Dunedin. And uh, so early in that week, he said, look, yeah, you have have an opportunity, and and uh, yeah, it was it was great. It was everything you sort of hoped for, I guess. And yep. we we ended up having a you know a, a really strong performance and and won well. Um, try on debut, which was nice, sort of bit of a bit of a you know, <laughs> lucky plum there. So that was that was nice. But yeah, the the lead up, the haka, the jersey presentation, all of that is um, firmly etched in the mind and and really special still. So uh, yeah, it was very very fortunate and privileged. I want to talk a little bit about a couple of things. One around, um, you know, you did, as you sort of hinted at a little bit before, you did uh, um, some time at Cambridge University playing rugby there, studying there. Um, was that a hint to, you know, almost before um, the RPA had like player development managers and was really focusing on trying to help our young players figure out what they're going to do off the field as well? Did you always have that view? Was that something you were always looking at or was it just an opportunity that popped up, you know, while you were going through, you know, the really early days of professional rugby, were you still thinking about, you know, what you might do with your career and, and um, you know, what that might look like? Because to probably pull yourself out of maybe playing for Taranaki or whatever it may be to go away and study, it's quite a big decision for a young guy. It probably all looks like it might be easy or smart now. But when you're a young mm. fella, you just want to probably jump out there and, you know, wear the Taranaki jersey and, and professional rugby was kicking off. It's all quite exciting. Yeah, I mean... Funnily enough, like we we had a great upbringing and childhood, um, my brother and I. We we absolutely loved, um, you know, how we grew up, and you know, we spent so much time on the farm and on sports fields and at school. And 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 farms were small, so you know, we had a hundred acres when we first started farming, and there were yeah. lots of hundred acre blocks, as <laughs> yeah. you probably appreciate. So within fifteen minutes of getting off the school bus, we were. Um, we were having a, a test match of some kind, be it rugby or cricket, in someone's backyard pretty quickly. But all through that time, despite the fondness of that, um, our, our parents, interestingly enough, had said, look, you, you know, right. we want you to get an education. We we don't expect you to um, – it's an option to sort of be on the farm, but it, it wasn't an expectation of theirs. And they were pretty firm that we should go away and, and do something else and explore different opportunities. And so from a very, very young age, that was sort of you know the, the path that, that Blair and I probably had. 
And um, for me, I guess going off to Cambridge was just an extension of that sort of adventure. You know, I had, I'd, I'd been at Victoria for, for a few years. I'd come back. I was sort of mulling over different things to do. There was opportunities to work, obviously. I'd, I don't know if I was too sort of keen <laughs> to do that yet. So, uh, and then I had an opportunity. There was a, a guy who's a good mate now called um, Steve Cottrell who yep. come back from his um, – first year at Cambridge, and sort of had gone around, you know, the university network and said, look, if anyone's interested in doing this, it's, it's an amazing uh, opportunity. He, he really vouched for it. So so I applied and um, was fortunate enough to, to get in. And so at the end of 97, I'd, le- I'd left Victoria, come up to Taranaki to play a year of club rugby in the MPC, and then jumped on a plane straight after that and was, um, you know, started a degree sort of September, October that year. And absolutely loved it I, it was just you know one of the best things I'd ever done it, it certainly opened my eyes I I lived in uh, in college with um, some people from I think you know people on opposite sides of me were you know one was a um, uh, Greek and one was uh, I think out of Miami you know and they were from different backgrounds <laughs> yeah. um, you know st- fellow students and just had an amazing time in, in that setting the way of learning was so much more challenging and, yeah. and stimulating and demanding but um, you know, highly sort of stimulating and invigorating, and and, and lots of fun. And I just met a, a great bunch of people that I've stayed, fortunately, uh, you know, stayed great mates with for, for many many years. So, uh, and even on my most recent trip up to to the UK, I managed to have a uh, get a Saturday off after a, a busy week with different things. And um, you know, a few of those mates came together at short notice, and and we always have a lot of fun. So yeah, I was, I was really lucky. I was lucky. I guess my, my parents were so firm of that view. Yeah. Um, and and it was something that you know I've never ever regretted. You know, going and, and exploring things like that. Oxford Cambridge match. It's you know pretty uh, well renowned traditional fixture. You know, you had played a little bit of first class rugby by then. Were you mm. nervous? Was there you know thirty forty thousand people plus at Twickenham? You know, like yeah. is the you know it's a it's a completely Corinthian and amateur environment like those universities. But that is the game of the year, isn't it? It's like the boat race. It is a big thing. Like, do you feel that, or are you just head down, um, you know, getting the studies done and rugby's the, the second thing that you do while you're there. Oh, like you say, for the first term, back back when I played, um, the varsity match was at the end of the first term. So for that first term, that was a, <laughs> that was that was a big focus. <laughs> you know, we were, playing, we were playing twice a week and we were, you know, for that, whatever it was, 10, 8 or 10 weeks. And um, we were training, you know, yep. whenever we could outside it. So it was, it was reasonably full. I mean, we still got through classes and the work we needed to do, but rugby was a, a very big focus. And, um, and you know, the lead-up to that match was incredible, you know, the, the sort of traditions where the captain dresses up in their big, you know, big <laughs> wool and blues blazers and they bike around the city and knock on your door and formally ask you to play in that game and then you've got dinners and, you know, meetings and trips Pomp to and London. Ceremony and, and yeah, yeah, you and know, you have, a, you have a port and nuts evening on the Tuesday, so you're told on the Sunday... Um, you're playing the you're playing ten days time the following Tuesday week. Yes. You know, so all through that week you have the Christmas committee dinner and then you have <laughs> Port and Nuts evening in Keys, which is one of the oldest colleges. And you you go in and um, as the name says, you, you sort of eat nuts and drink port and yeah. things and all, you know all these yeah. sorts of things that you never learn. And those were all just ama- they just really opened my eyes to um, and just happened you know, for years, doing like yeah. hundreds and hundreds yeah. of years. Like, well, it's I think, amazing. I, I think the fixture was a hundred and. 20 odd years old when wow. I was there, you know, so it's probably well over, must be up to around 150 odd years now. So, um, amazing. So, um, so that was great. And the match itself, um, so it was actually the crowd was about 70,000 people in my first year. I remember running out and thinking, wow, this is, you know, for a bunch of scarfies <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 so, right, from all around different parts of the world. Uh, and then I had this really strange sort of dilemma as the anthem kicked off God Save the Queen. Ugh. Um, Ugh. yeah, I just didn't know the, the crowd roared and I thought, what do I do? You know, I didn't yeah. feel an urge to sing it, but I've, am I being rude here? Or yeah, yeah, sort of, yeah. But um, so anyway, I'm just standing there and, and being in awe of this sort of crowd. It was by far the biggest crowd I'd played in front of at that stage. And, and I was fortunate in both years, again, the, a big crowd the following year, and we won both years. And, awesome. um, you know, we had, a, like I said before, great team, great people, great sort of culture environment, and um, a lot of fun. So again, fortunate enough to have great memories there too. Before we get into you know some of the the governance administration, um, which is you know what you're involved in today, like reflecting back on the career, some of the the you know the 
the players you, you played against that gave you a headache or, or people that you look back and think, geez, that guy was a good player, whether it could be just be on a Saturday afternoon for Coastal or whether it be, you know, playing <laughs> professional rugby, is there anyone in particular that sticks out as, as um, you know, a really strong player and, and you know, someone that um, you always think about when you look back on the career? Yeah, I mean, I mean there's certainly lots of individuals. The way I probably look at it now is when you played... Um, big games against teams and and playing against back lines, I guess, yeah. was something that um, resonates for me. And I remember we had a great rivalry with the Crusaders against the Brumbies back in those days. Yeah. You know, we played a number of finals against them and big games and, and round robin fixtures too. And I remember when they were really in their pomp, you know, with um, Greg and Larkham, yeah. you know, Kay from Mortlock, Walker, you know, they they had a, yeah, a phenomenal team. And and it just felt some like sometimes you were. You didn't know where they were coming from, you know. This is when Eddie Jones crafted this way. They had lots of different sequences and angles and things going on. And they were leading, weren't they? They were leading the professional yeah, game in terms was, of innovations and the Gregan out the back to Finnegan and all yeah, these different yeah. things that were going on. Yeah, like they, they were, were leading. Yeah. So you, I remember, you know, having to be right on your game. And even if you were, there'd be moments where you weren't going to sort of be able to contain them all the time. You just had to hang in there when they'd get on a roll and do things. So they were, they were definitely a, a team um, and a backline with heaps of, you know. Stars that were um, that were really really uh, great to play against and a great challenge, but always you know you had to be at your best to sort of compete with them. And then the other back line in that space probably, but for sort of different reasons, they might not have had the same structure as the Hurricanes. You know yep. when they had um, Tana, Cully, um, Jonah, you know Alama, they had they Stacks. they had an amazing group as well, and they could just hurt you from everywhere and. Yep. And all of those guys could do something from nothing. And, and so, again, you just had to be at your best. And there was just sometimes you had to stand back and say, well, you know, you, you, can't, you might not be able to do much about that. Yeah. So that, that were probably the two teams that, um, that stood out the most with all those sort of individuals I mentioned. Mate, so, look, your first sort of, um, you know, as you came out of, of playing and, and started getting into the, the nine-to-fives, you know, and that sort of thing, like you did eventually become, you know, CE of, Talanaki Rugby, you know, the, the place where you, you know, played all your, your grassroots footy, where you grew up, where you knew a whole lot of people. Like, was that um, always a part of the plan, something you aspired to do to get into, um, you know, rugby off the field, or was it something that came about um, fortuitously? Um, I don't know if it was planned, but I don't know if it was completely fortuitous either <laughs> sort of thing. You know, it was sort of, we, we finished, Nova and I, um, I'd finished playing in Japan Oh, it's been around 2006, and we had a really interesting decision to make around um, whether we go back. There was the opportunity, I guess, with the, um, the the networks I've been able to develop through rugby and through time at Cambridge and that about going back into um, either UK or or Europe or even into areas like um, Singapore and Hong Kong at that oh, stage yeah. with different, different work. But we felt really strongly. We'd just started a family. Hunter would have been probably a year old at that yeah. stage, our eldest. And we just had this, the more we sat back and talked about it, we thought, well, no, we really want you know, the family to, um, um, to grow up as, as Kiwis and we really wanted to be back in New Zealand. I guess Nova's from a small town, she's for a Northland, yep. um, you know, a, a Northland uh, girl and she's sort of uh, got really strong sort of values as I do around, you know, what the benefits of small town uh, New Zealand can offer for a, yep. for a growing family and that sort of thing. And my... We were expecting Maggie not far off, so we had our first two children quite close together. And it just felt like going back to New Zealand was the right thing to do and hadn't really thought too far about, uh, hit about, you know, career or anything like that. Um, but clearly had, had managed to um, go through a couple of degrees and then an opportunity came up to go back to Taranaki. And, and at the time, I, you know, I probably wasn't 100% prepared for it, but it certainly lit something within me about wanting to go, go back home for a period of time. And it was a huge challenge um, to go back into an environment like that where there's always you know, high expectations around rugby, totally. passionate rugby province, care deeply, want to do well. And um, had an amazing you know, five years there of, of lots and lots of different experiences, you know, the good and some, um, some really exciting stuff, some challenges and some mistakes inevitably that you sort of grow and learn through. So, so that was sort of my history going into, into that. And, um, and as I say, we were there. In the end, we... We lived in Taranaki for eight or nine years, and so the kids, you know, had an amazing time. We we lived in a um, small village around the coast called Aukura, and um, great beach, you know, very close to the mountains, the rivers, and that sort of thing. And so it was a really nice time for the kids to play lots of different sports, do lots of different things, um, 
and have a really, yeah, dare I say it, nice, basic, sort of simple life, which was lots of fun. Mate, what was the was it a positive or a negative? Probably knowing every single family and person in the area. <laughs> I, I don't know if you're CEO in the changing rooms of Coastal Third Grade from time to time, and probably solve some of the problems you know there over the smell of liniment. But you know, like was was that a positive or a negative, or a bit of both? I think a bit of both. You yeah. know, I mean, Robbo, do this. <laughs> Come on, Robbo, you got to do this, mate. Well, inevitably, when you when you get into situations with people face to face, you know, yeah. there, there might be a bit of noise around sometimes. But when you actually do find the time to sit with yeah. people and either in a club rooms or wherever you might be um, in that environment, normally you can have a good sort of rational yeah. conversation with them. And, and that's what would happen most yeah. of the time, you know. The, um, and, and there was a fair amount of banter with it. You know, most people knew that no matter what's going on, you're, you're doing your absolute best and <laughs> yeah. the people around you are doing your best. And and so um, so by and large, it was it was mostly really positive and, and sort of an opportunity for a bit of banter. And to be in those environments, you know, I'd, I riffed a bit of kids rugby when I was Brilliant. there, you know, and, and I'd play senior thirds and um, I was a junior convener at the Kaitaki Rugby Club um, yeah. for four or five years and, and rugby um, had gone into a bit of a lull there and so, you know, had the opportunity to be involved in sort of building the sport back up in, in that little... Um, township. So all of that stuff was just great for giving you insights into the role that I had with Taranaki as well. So mostly hugely positive. Coalface stuff that is, I love it. So yeah. what, I mean, as you emerged, you know, your New Zealand Rugby Board, World Rugby representative, like how did those things come about? Like was it was it the administrational side of being CEO of Taranaki that sort of did start you getting really interested in those bigger roles? You're doing some stuff at the coalface and the grassroots, but then actually as you grew older, you know, um, the boots were well and truly hung up. you you started to look at the, the wider rugby landscape and that interest you? Yeah, I mean, with regards to New Zealand rugby, which inevitably led to the opportunity to be on the World Rugby Board, that, that came about a oh, 12 to 18 months after I'd left the Taranaki role and had an approach from a number of different stakeholders and people across the game to ask whether I was interested in, in um, putting my name forward for the New Zealand Board. So I um, talked to my employer at the time. I was with a company called Simmons Group at the time. And I was into the role for a long enough period probably to, you know, understand it and, and um, it was trending okay. So we found the opportunity to find the time to be able to do it. And and obviously had to connect with Nova and the family and make sure, because it meant a bit of travel, yeah. um, especially once I made the, I was um, put on as New Zealand rugby's delegate to world rugby. It just meant travelling overseas, you know, three or four times a year for anywhere from sort of one to two weeks. So that... That just added a bit of complexity to life, but um, fortunately we were all able to make it happen, and and it just sort of sprung board from there, really. Mate, these days you're you're CEO of New Zealand Rugby, and like probably came in at you know perhaps one of the most disruptive times in our rugby history with COVIDs and all the different things that there always seems to be something going on, and I suggest there always will be. But like, let's talk a little bit about the role, what it entails. Like you are on the big bird on the jet plane a wee bit, you know, mm. Sands are World Rugby, Six Nations, etc. Like. What are those conversations you're having like and in, in, in terms of, you know, you made the point a little bit before, like sometimes, um, you know, things are portrayed in a certain way, but when you get in front of people and have a good yarn with other rugby people, you can normally find some sort of common ground. Is that what happens, you know, when you're away? Like what are the, you know, perhaps to nail a question down, what are the, the two or three things um, that are actually taking up most of your time at the moment um, with those world rugby groups? The the international game is absolutely a critical part of the role, and and sometimes that's probably not you know that that well um, known or understood, and, and yep. that's just the way things are really. I mean, in New Zealand, it's a you know there's a lot of scrutiny. Um, it's a relatively small sort of isolated sort of market and and um, environment we're in, and so a lot of the issues we focus on around the game are domestic issues, and yeah, you, you know you have to make sure that we've got great people along those domestic issues working on them um, as well. Um, but the international stuff, I guess it peaked in terms of time I spent away from the country in 2022 because that was when I guess the world opened up again and I spent probably close to 20 weeks overseas wow. building you know, relationships back up, be it with uh, the National Union, SANSA, Six Nations and commercial partners. Um, since that time it's probably reduced a little bit. I think last uh, yeah, 2023 was probably you know, more like... 15 to 16 weeks and this year I'm hoping it's sort of around 12 to 14 weeks so gradually we probably work on a, a equilibrium which is closer to what it's going to be this year hopefully <laughs> yeah. um, and the conversations as they relate to, to World Rugby Six Nations and Sands are at the moment there are a number of different strands I guess um, firstly I'd say we all have the same issues like if you look at if you look at every national union from a 
um, from a from a grassroots community level game to the same issues are, are emerging. You know, around the participation trends in the game, very yeah. very similar right across the game. So we, we're looking at everything um, that can be done on a global at a global scale on on those such a, uh, sorts of challenges around the community game, and then right through to a main focus at the moment in terms of two or three key things around this new calendar that we're working on yep. around the Nations Cup, which we see as a really exciting opportunity for the top 12 teams in the in the world, and then the Challenger Series, which is the next 12 teams in the year, world over time being able to um, get into a promotion relegation sort of format that uh, that works well. So there's been a lot of a lot of work going into that around you know the the playing schedule. Um, player welfare, how it all works, yeah. the commercial model that works with it, and that sort of thing. And and I think you know we're making good progress on on that at the moment. Um, and as I say, coming back from the recent meetings in in London last week, um, sometimes it feels incredibly slow, but overall it's still <laughs> it's still inching forward. And then I think the other major thing we're working on as a as a whole of game is this whole notion of shape a game. And yep. it's been some incredibly positive, we believe, when you look at Super Rugby this year, trends around you know. Uh, the tempo of the game, the yep. attractiveness of the game, less intervention. You know, I don't think there's anyone um, at the moment that would, would disagree that the product in terms of what's happening on the field around Super Rugby this year has just been superb. So so we're delighted that, you know, we know when we put our mind to it as a game that we can create an immediate impact around, yep. you know, if we can build consensus and build um, a real momentum around the game, wanting to change, that we can have a tremendous product. When you see... You know, still believe it or not, I'm biased, but the best game of rugby played. You know, it is. It's still the greatest sport in the world, and I think we're we're starting to see a, a sort of, you know, some global momentum around wanting to recognise that. And I think even the the second half of Six Nations this year, watching yeah. some of the European games yeah. um, and into the playoffs now, we're starting to see that as well. So, so I guess the time spent on that international stage is is multifaceted. Everything from community to shape a game to you know, commercial and to international tournaments and competitions and calendars. And um, it's just reality. It's a really important, you know, part of the game. Totally. Let's talk about, um, dig down to a few things like um, MOU with Japan. Like that's something that, you know, I've, I've read a little bit about over the last sort of year or two. Like how did that come about and what's, you know, what's the purpose of that? Why are we going into a, a memorandum of understanding with, you know, one of our closest rugby neighbours? Well, I guess when you step back from... Um, you know the the game here. We we have to acknowledge that we we need partnerships on on the international stage, and we've got lots of really well established partnerships in traditional markets such yep. as the UK and and um, and Europe. But clearly, if you look at the 2019 World Cup in Japan, um, it's 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 really easy to see the passion they have for the game and the population and the strength of market they have and strength of economy and large businesses that are closely connected to rugby. So I guess we we took a view that as as the world settled down after COVID, that that was an opportunity. And there is a long shared history between the two countries as it relates to rugby um, by virtue of so many Kiwis going oh, out there over the last unreal. 20 or 30 years playing, totally. myself included. So so I was fortunate to have a lot of um, close connections up there. Actually, the, the current CEO of... Uh, Japan rugby, Ken Ibuchi is a good friend of mine from Cambridge University. Awesome. So, um, so relationships like that formed the basis of being able to go in and have conversations about the way the two countries could work together and building a program over the long term. Because historically, in terms of creating um, relationships with with Japan, we'd very much done it on a sort of ad hoc basis, gone yep. there every you know four to six to eight years or something, and played, and then carried on up maybe to the northern hemisphere. This model has us playing um, at different stages, maybe at, at two to three different times of the year. So in February, you'd have seen this year, Super Rugby teams went up and played did, yeah. with the Chiefs and the Blues. Um, the Māori All Blacks are going to be there um, for two tests in July, and then we've got the All Blacks going there at the end of the year. And I guess the other national teams we see as opportunities will be in time, you know, what can our sevens teams do there? Yep. Um, what can our women's teams do there? Um, yep. And then building on, you know, is there anything beyond what we did this year with Super Rugby that we can maybe look at League One there, which is a growing in terms of strength of the competition, to be able to work in with them? And does that sit, you know, at the start mm. of the year around February, or is that something that's more coordinated around the playoffs? And so all of those possibilities, once you develop a, a memorandum of understanding like this, you, you form the basis for a high degree of trust and, and openness about the way that the two countries can work together and really try to grow rugby in, in both of our markets. And and it's also something different for our players and yeah. coaches, which I think is hugely exciting too. So 
So connecting to a big fan base, connecting to a strong economy, um, the drive for you know international partnerships are all sort of the principles involved in, in wanting to progress that. I like it. I must admit, like um, almost by accident, I saw some of the preseason games um, from the super sides, and one thing I really liked, enjoyed, noticed, was just a completely different style of rugby from the Japanese teams. There's quite a few Kiwis on the Japanese teams, but just. High tempo, different, throwing different things at us. Not sort of maybe the traditional, um, you know, shape and structure, and and you know maybe trying to bend the advantage line with big bodies that you know, we often see. Now it was quite refreshing actually to see really high tempo stuff, some pretty mm-hmm. innovative backline moves, like just a completely different way to come at rugby. So I suppose mm-hmm. that can only be a good thing. Yeah. The, the other the other key point there is there's there's opportunities wider than rugby, you know. So we've been able to connect with the, the embassy, oh, yeah. New Zealand embassy. Um, we've been able to have conversations with New Zealand Trade and Enterprise with awesome. with the government. So I think as as is many things in rugby, it provides the the vehicle far wider than just what happens on the field sometimes to do really cool stuff. Yeah, and we see that with a lot of our cool domestic programs we have um, in New Zealand, and we also see it on the international stage of, of this being able to be a a real connector for people doing doing business or you know involved in diplomacy or or various parts of politics. So so that's a really interesting connector that we're really pleased is sort of emerging too. I like that. Rugby is a bit of a gateway for all sorts of things. But there's, if we come back home a little bit, like um, in many regards, rugby stays the same, but it changes a lot as well. If you look at the growth of the women's game, if you look at, um, you know, weight grade rugby, ripper rugby, like I see a lot of ripper rugby in the summer, you know, like is does that happen organically? Or is there strategies in place in New Zealand rugby to try and, um, I suppose, make the game as low to no barrier as possible to anyone who wants to have a crack? Yeah, no, there's certainly strategy behind it, Rob. You know, we're working really hard to um, acknowledge that the game has to change, it has to evolve, and we want our, our game to be the greatest sport in terms of, um, you know, the ease of access, safety, fun. Um, we want our environments to be places that people love being in, you know, and yeah. and that are as open as possible to as many diverse ranges of people as we can possibly have involved in the sport. So, so we've got a great team working on this. Ultimately, um, I guess we lead the strategy in this in this space. Be it, as you say, women and girls, or in Pacifica, um, a lot of our work in um, diversity, inclusion, and rainbow community. All yeah. of those things, I guess, we ultimately have to take a leadership role on. But we're very dependent on our partnerships through the provincial unions to be able to actually execute and deliver that on the ground. And um, we've got some great programs running, you know, all around um, the country at the moment that are seeing, you know, some really positive results. And so sometimes, you know, when there's a little bit of negativity of the game, you do have to remind yourself there's just some every weekend there's just amazing things happening right across the country in our sport. I think. You know, Canterbury, I was told the other day, have something like nine or ten extra Colts teams this year from last wow. year playing. You know, the, you know, I was down at the reunion I talked about before. Yeah. You know, I was at um, the Opanaki Club grounds. They had a grading round and ran into guys from the Clif- Clifton Club and that. They say their numbers have, you know, spiked up through the roof at, at Ripper level this year. And there's, there's great people doing good things with a huge amount of passion for the game and really benefiting from some of the frameworks and resources that we're able to put behind them to help them you know, when they're working in their communities, which you know, we're really proud of and excited about for the future. Totally. I had a good little weekend last weekend watching the uh, Tapuna Premier Women's Team. First year for them, um, going really well. And, and I'm also registered for the Tapuna Colts, which is also Colts under 85, which I go. am well and truly under 85, Robbo. So I yeah. could be getting the call up <laughs> in the near future. There's been a few well, uh, you, dings and dongs, you know. You and I've fight. got a lot to offer, Robbo, all right? <laughs> you have. You, you certainly have. I'm, I'm pleased you raised that. Because, I mean, you might get to play in a, one of these finals. I think um, the That's under 85 grand final has been played as a only way I get on a first class ground <laughs> <laughs> totally I saw that and I actually saw guys um, that I used to play rugby with at high school old boys who are now um, sort of carrying on their rugby journey by not playing prem rugby anymore but playing under 85 rugby and, mm. and actually um, you know having the experience that yeah perhaps you know we all loved used to play at Hagley Park and, mm. and love that at Bob Dean's Oval but it's actually an opportunity for these guys. They played their final at North Harbour Stadium and, and it was televised and, and that, yeah. that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. So. And that grade um, nationally has only increased, um, I'm trying to think, was it 2022, the first year or 2021? But every year across yeah. the national competition has increased you know, yeah. in numbers of, of registrations and, and participants in that grade. So, you know, another wonderful um, initiative that we've led that we're hugely proud of. And, and Ted Henry, you know, Graham, a, a fiercely... Um, 
sort of uh, proud advocate of, of that competition <laughs> totally. as well, you know. Yes. And, and we're looking at doing some stuff more on the international stage, you know, with a with a national team maybe coming together and touring in parts of Asia where we see this um, format being something that can really grow the game globally and, and play into that market. Much along the way we talked about connecting with Japan, you know, there may be more opportunities to play in other parts of Asia with this sort of... Um, Format as well. Pretty cool to see the New Zealand under eighty five team play the Thailand under eighty five team or something along those lines, wouldn't it? That'd be yeah, a little yeah. little trip. I might put the boots back. <laughs> I wouldn't not make that team. But there's um, look, we talked a little about the women's game. Like there's, it's something we talk about a lot. The growth of it. Like, um, how are we going to sustain that growth in terms of you know what are the things we're putting in place? Whether it be the professional uh, professional component with Super Rugby Opeki, or whether it be you know the example I just gave my local club where you know we've now got. 25 female rugby players for the first time some are 17 years old and and some are genuinely 35 years old you know yeah. like really exciting stuff but like um, how are we going to continue to make sure um, that we're able to sustain this growth and that it becomes continues to be such an awesome part of our game yeah well, we launched um, the women and girls strategy obviously uh, I think the start of start of last year and that's a commitment of over 20 million dollars a year yeah. um, that goes into programs right across the game and and they're focused as you say to your question around the wide spectrum of um, opportunities here everything from you know junior club rugby and working with provinces there through to secondary school rugby and into our development and high performance pathways and ultimately um, what is currently a sort of semi-professional game until the um, till the athletes come through and are playing in the in the Black Ferns or Black Ferns Sevens team. So, at every step of the way, we are trying. Um, you know, we, we have plans and are trying new initiatives to test here. Um, the community game's really interesting. You know, provinces are mm-hmm. different in terms of you know depending on the population bases and and um, the way that um, you know club seasons work there. So. You know, there's an element of leadership we're certainly taking with our strategy, but we have to acknowledge that yeah. some environments are different, and and uh, we have to work in a more bespoke way um, with those environments. But we're seeing a huge amount of um, passion at the community level and, and interest in the game and right, large rides in numbers, and we're seeing a huge amount of talent coming in through to our you know our performance pathways, uh, and we're starting to see some of that come into the Opiki environment. So around Opiki that you you sort of ask about, we um, certainly will. Uh, next year have the same format as what we had this year and but we are looking for a, a crossover finals oh, yeah. opportunity with Australia cool. and then from 2026 um, you know we'll have to work with you know Australia um, and see what they want to do around the number of teams they have and if there's a possibility of growing the competition um, with them and then you know the conversations are sort of emerging around Japan and in North America, where obviously the women's game is is quite strong, um, so the other things that we've sort of got on the radar for the um, you know the club competition at, at Opiki level, and then at you know Black Ferns, I think nine tests this year. You know, it's yeah. by far the most test matches we've we've ever had um, for the Black Ferns. I think traditionally, you know, two to maybe three yeah. test matches a year. Uh, that game we launched. Um, to be played at Twickenham in, in September, we're massively excited about. We think you know it could maybe sell out um, Twickenham awesome. and, and create a record crowd for the for the women's game. So now our athletes and Alan and, and Haller's management team are hugely excited about it. And so seeing them begin that journey to become more fully fledged as a as a team with serious campaigns and that is, is massively exciting. And ultimately, with that team, we are working towards you know having success at the at the World Cup in 2025 in England as well. So so lots of exciting stuff going on. I uh, totally and like I watched uh, unfortunately they went down but watching uh, the Black Fern Sevens play Australia at the moment is must watch TV like they are seriously good they've got a seriously good rivalry going on at the same time as well but some yeah. of those young girls coming through um, are, are outstanding players mate let's talk last thing on the women's game is the British and Ireland, Irish Lions tour like um, I think we've put our hand up there haven't we and, and like that's what 227 so just over a couple of years away that I mean that's hugely exciting what was the origin of that was that something that was going to come out of of the men's British and Irish Lions tour or is that like you say when you're you know out and about in different parts of the world discussing the next thing that we can do in the world game is that is that one of the things yeah it, it really came out of conversations as you say on the sort of in the international environments um, and working with the uh, the Lions team. Um, it was it was probably in the middle of COVID. Actually, we talked about this, and they were having a challenging time with regards to what was happening with the South Africa tour. Right. Um, they were looking forward to Australia beyond that and being in our part of the world. And it was at the time leading into the Women's World Cup here. 
um, where we started to sort of kick this around and think about it. And then, of course, the, the way that the World Cup grabbed the nation here and the way that it, you know, um, yeah. transformed the profile of, of the team and, and the women's game through that sort of six or seven weeks was um, truly extraordinary and, and something that we just knew we had to sort of work hard to to build some sort of legacy off. So obviously the plan I talked about before is working really well at the community um, level, but providing real tentpole moments around pinnacle events and opportunities was critical as well. So we had um, the growing competition around Opeki, we had um, 2025 World Cup to be played in England, and we just saw the natural progression of this being something like um, the Lions Tour for 2027. So that's going to be an incredible event. It'll dovetail nicely into yeah. um, Rugby World Cup in Australia in 2027. So I think, you know, the Lions tour against the, the Black Ferns will finish a week or two before the, the World Cup starts. So we're expecting wow. a lot of tour, uh, tourists down from uh, from the UK and, and Ireland and, and looking forward to welcoming them and then giving them a you know, an off ramp into to Australia to get to <laughs> yeah. get stuck into the to the to the Rugby World Cup in Aussie. So so that'll be huge. And then um you know, we're looking quite soon after that, I think um the the women's world Cup comes back to Australia, you know, in twenty twenty nine. So if you look at wow. um Some the progression and opportunities there, in front yeah. of yeah, in front of the Black Ferns, um and we think that'll that'll be something truly unique and different in terms of rugby as an international sport for women uh, in terms of aspirations and, and things to stay around and really work hard for in, in the future of the game. Robbo, a big part of your role is, is implementing the strategy, setting the strategy, implementing the strategy with you and the team at New Zealand Rugby in partnership with the board. And there's um, sort of, like, where are we at? I suppose we had, you know, last year was, was a big milestone, you know, Rugby World Cup and, and a fantastic tournament um, with some really memorable moments. You know, the boys went down by one point in the final, but like, geez, well attended and some fantastic games of footy. And, you know, I was I was on the couch fist pumping in, in the Irish game. I was, um, you know, I was fist pumping until the last minute in this African game. You know, like it's, it was awesome. But like now that we're, we're clear of that, like, mm. what's the future look like for us over the next three years? What does the strategy look like? What are you trying to achieve Um you know, up until you know some of those really significant moments and tournaments throw the men's world cup in there as well. Um, you know, what are you working on at the moment um, over the next few years? Well, we are we are taking the opportunity. You know, we, we developed a strategy out to twenty five, and we're currently sort of having a, a, a look at that at the moment and refreshing that. I guess with the establishment of New Zealand Rugby Commercial, yeah. Craig Fenton, the incoming CEO, um, there is building up his strategy and getting. Um, close to sort of rolling that out and finalising it and we are at the same time in parallel thinking about how we refine our focus across the sport and so one of the things we are working on um, is is looking at um, what what are the key products, what are the key deliverables that yeah. we're involved with in New Zealand rugby and when you think about the commercial strategy in terms of um, you know driving value to be able to reinvest into the sport that's critically you know important mm. for us. Um, and then the two other key areas for us are the community game and then um, creating advantages for the teams in black to perform really well on the global stage. So so if you like, we've got this sort of interconnected strategy evolving where um, the community rugby is definitely at the base, but we need to make sure, as I said before, that we've got as many young people, boys and girls coming into our game, having great experiences, um, working in great environments where they develop a lifelong love of the game. Um, that clearly feeds into our into our performance and development pathways. So we're putting you know more thought around our strategy and making best use of resources there because that ultimately drives the performance of our teams in black. Yeah. And winning on the world stage is absolutely critical for us in terms of driving value. And then I guess that intersects again with um, the opportunity we have in the commercial space to be able to drive value and, and grow revenue across the sport to be able to reinvest. So those three yeah. key sort of... Um, areas of the game are what we're spending a lot of time with at the moment. And then in parallel to that, um, a really important piece of work going on at the moment domestically around um, our men's competitions and pathways. There's been you know, a lot of talk about you know, the, the future of NPC and Super Rugby and that sort of thing. We see the NPC as absolutely critical to our future, but we all acknowledge, and I think everyone across the game um, is talking about the, there needs to be consideration of the change or evolution of that. So we're putting... Um, some work into that at the moment, which is travelling in parallel to this strategic work. And I guess the overall opportunity we see is to build um, 
a, a model which, when you step back from it, has become financially sustainable because yep. that has been, you know, over the last 20 plus years, that has been a real challenge for the game. And um, we hope that, I guess, all of that work coming together that I've just talked about can provide the platform to create a really sustainable game where we are able to, um, you know, reinvest in the right levels of the game, reinvest into the areas that are clear that are strategically important, and then make sure that we're a viable. Um, sport where all levels of the sport uh, are truly sustainable. So, so that that's sort of you know if I was to package it up at the moment, busy um, little Saturday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. And and we're you know at the same time the team's doing a great job. As I said before, excited about the way Super Rugby started. Um, you know, teams in black, the sevens are you know like close on the weekend as you say, oh. but by and large performing really well as we build totally. into Paris. Um, some great numbers coming out in the community game at the moment. I think we're. Um, seven or so percent above last oh, yeah. year, year on year okay. in terms of participation numbers. So, yep. so we're really excited about some of the things that we're putting into place um, for the future. Mate, it's awesome. So, mate, looking forward for uh, looking forward to the rest of the year. Like, are, are you getting up to Paris? So are you going to be supporting the sides up there? Like, um, you know, you, there's a bit of work going on at Super Rugby at the moment. What the season looks like next year? We've got, you know, um, Scott Robinson, you new team of all black coaches they've got and we've got England England have been here since 2014 I'm told so like yep. there's plenty to look forward to what's kind of um, in your diary mate what are you looking forward to most like and even maybe um, something new coming into play that you and the team have been working on you know like what, what are we looking out for for the rest of the year as kind of the the grassroots footy is well and truly underway. We'll get into to club finals and all those sorts of things mm. really soon, which is awesome. Um, and then we start leading into, you know, when some of our professional players um, start doing their stuff as well. Um, well, there, there's there's a huge amount going on. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, we're, we're about to get into playoffs of Super Rugby and, yep. and all indications are they'll be well attended in ground and, yep. and great broadcast numbers, media numbers we've had coming through. So we're excited about that. As you say, Razor will name his um, first team soon after the, the final. So we're looking forward to that launch and this you know, um, new regime um, of coaches, management and players coming through. You know, and it's a great series to start start off with. We've got a great relationship with England, so they're coming down and we're going to spend some time with them talking about, um, you know, the the... I guess the shape of the game here, things we're working on and they've got lots of cool stuff to share as well so we're looking forward to that connection. We're starting to bring stakeholders um, together now that we've worked through the governance review you know, we're looking forward to catching up with um, provincial union CEOs yeah. at the end of the month in Napier and spending a couple of days with them talking about the future and and some of the strategic work I, I talked about before um, we get into Olympics, at this stage I'm, I'm not um, going to Paris, just you know, my second half of the year with other travel around yeah. um, around San Diego and Africa and and then back up to the Northern Hemisphere at the end of the year makes it a little bit more challenging but um, certainly be down to see the team in the coming weeks and making sure they're well prepared to, to head off. And then we're into an amazing you know second half of the year around um, domestic you know competitions, uh, Heartland, NPC, FPC, those sorts of things. Uh, rugby championship will be huge. You know, we know that that's oh, going to be. be massive. And if we dial back a little bit from there, San Diego is our first big foray into the states for a long time. Um, you know, we were there at the end of I think it was a twenty one or twenty one. It might have been, which was quite a challenging time to be touring. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is a really exciting opportunity. We're doing quite a lot of stuff. You know, as it relates to the content side of the business and things we're looking at um, in the US at the moment. So, so that'll be. Um, a real milestone moment, rugby championship, and then before we know it, we'll be on sort of end of year tour, and and that's an amazing five uh, game program yeah. um, right through you know Asia and to UK Europe. So um, I know the second half of the year will just fly through. Oh, to be totally. honest, you know there's there's so much cool stuff going on, and then as you say, we we know that I think in early July the the club finals will start up, and there'll be lots of really cool stuff happening at the community level. So lots of great stuff going on. Um, you know, lots of stuff to look forward to at all levels of the game, and and we're just really looking forward to you know building momentum and and carrying on the work we're doing. Hundred percent, looking forward to. There's always going to be in every year there is some new All Blacks name. That's always pretty exciting. Razor, I'm loving. I'm really looking forward to Razor playing Joe Smith for the first time. <laughs> I think that's going to be pretty exciting. Add a little bit of um, flavour to the first Blitters low. Fiji All Blacks up in San Diego, and then off on a Northern Hemisphere tour. Like there is heaps going on, mate. Thank you for coming in and spending a bit of time with us. I know the diary is traditionally pretty full. 
all. So I appreciate you um, giving us a bit of time. And also, it's fantastic to hear a little bit about your journey as well. You know, like, um, you know, someone who's absolutely um, gone on on a really similar path to a lot of people in rugby and, and now is, you know, um, leading our game and, and, and a lot for you to work on. I really appreciate the hard work. So cheers, mate. Thanks for coming in. Pleasure, Rob. Great to, uh, great to be on board. Thank you.